Got it. Yeah, sure. We can start. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to wherever you are. Uh, like uh, presented earlier, my name is Dr. Emmanuel Kiniga, my urology resident. Uh, presenting two cases for DSD. Uh, this is a FM, a male patient, raised as a male, uh, three years old, was seen three hours from Kigali in a teaching hospital. His chief complaint was a descended testicle on the left. He had a penile deformity since birth with an abnormal natal opening. Uh, his growth and development and milestones were appropriately attained, no admissions. Uh, it was an uneventful pregnancy, uh, term delivery had good scores. Uh, this child was a firstborn. Uh, in terms of the mother, she was a business lady, no contraceptive use, no alcohol or smoking history, and uh, no previous pregnancy losses. Basically a normal pregnancy and delivery. Uh, his vital signs, uh, nutritional status and uh, uh, hydration status are within range and cardio uh, logical cardiovascular abdominal exams were within normal limits. In terms of uh, a focused genital urinary exam, uh, on physical exam, there was a severe CODI, uh, there was a meatal scrotal opening, uh, penoscrotal transposition, and a phallus of around three centimeters. There was a right gonad that was. Uh, palpable in the scrotum with, and the consistency and, and, and the size thought was of a testis, a normal size testis. Uh, the left gonad was non-palpable uh, with an empty and developed left hemiscrotum. If you, can you see my cursor? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah, so you see dorsal uh, skin hood, this was a phallus, uh, the meters was around this position mid scrotal. As you can see, some fullness in the right hemiscrotum. And this actually was the gonad that was palpable. And you can see an obvious asymmetry on the contralateral left and no palpable gonad. So at this point, we thought of a three year old hypospadias, a penoscrotal position with bilateral and extended testes. Our initial uh, plan was to do a gen karyotype, abdominal pelvic ultrasound, and uh, hormonal profile. So the karyotype uh, 46XX. Now that was the karyotype. Uh, so in the report 46XX, testicular disorder of sexual development. Uh, we referred the patient to Kigali, now uh, the capital city, where a diagnostic laparoscopy was done. Now the positive findings were right patent processors vaginalis with vast difference, and uh, testicular vessels were normal. A rudimentary uterus was noted, mullerian remnant, and the left gonad did appear like an ovary with an fallopian and also a ligament. And a biopsy was taken of this uh, left gonad. Now, the pathology from the gonadal biopsy left was benign ovarian stroma with follicles in different levels of differentiation. And at this point, uh, our conclusion then was a three-year-old, six uh, XX of the particular DSD. Uh, so these were the preliminary uh, hormonal profile: uh, FSH, LH, progesterone, estradiol, prolactin, testosterone, and cortisol. Uh, all was within range except the estradiol, which for this age group was slightly low. Uh, so in, in, in this case, uh, in particular, we had a family discussion with the mother and the father. They would wish to raise him as a boy. A pediatrician, a psychologist, and a psychiatrist have been involved. Uh, we did have some challenges, uh, especially in this case, uh, in terms of how to do it. Uh, do you do both gonads? Uh, gender assignment, when do we do it? The implications and the role of parents. Uh, like for this child, they want to keep him as a boy. We have challenges with obtaining 17 hydroxy progesterone within uh, locally. That's a challenge. And as we speak, we are following up and we are offering the necessary psychological support. I will also go through a second case. We, uh, KIS, uh, female, our first contact was in November last year. 
and one year old uh, referred from a district hospital uh, with sons of a Kali, a town baby, delivered at three kilos, an eventful pregnancy was a first one, similar to the first one. Mother was a young lady, 22 years old, no consanguinity of parents. In terms of clinical, uh, clinical examination, uh, positive findings were craniofacial dysmorphism, a low set and evaporated ears, a poorly developed mandible, uh, respiratory, cardiovascular, and abdominal were within normal limits. Now, in terms of peripheral uh, and seemingly normal appearing labia majora, there was a promegaly, and a vaginal orifice was noted, though short, and there are no palpable uh, uh, gonads palpated. In this uh, time, with this, in his assessment, uh, her assessment was a craniofacial dysmorphism. We thought, uh, or currently, the current impression is a teacher, a teacher colleague syndrome. I'll put a, a photo just to give you a visual representation of the child. Uh, we also thought of a congenital adrenal hyperplasia with virilization. And we involved the pediatric endocrinologists, a genetician for review. Uh, so this was the pre preliminary lab evaluation, basically a normal um, urea, uh, renal function test and urea and electrolytes. Uh, we did have a progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, cardio, uh, and cortisol evening and morning. And they were within range. Now that's a slow, uh, a, a, a lower testosterone compared to the standard. Huh? In terms of gene karyotype, uh, 46XY was noted. Uh, we did a ultrasound uh, abdomen. Uh, concern terrus was noted at Nexa, all within normal location. No testes was noted. A normal urinary bladder and uh, solid organs. And from this ultrasound report, they, they, they were suggestive of a female fish. I've put, uh, attached a photo of the constitution of the mother. Uh, on inspection, first, what is what is uh, You can see a well-developed uh, labia and uh, the, the clitoral megali. Uh, so this is now from almost like a superior point of view, you can see the, the clitoromegaly. Uh, sorry, uh, we estimated to be around 1.5 to 2 centimeters and then the, the labia and there was a vaginal orifice. So in summary, we have 46 Collins syndrome with female internal genital structures. As we speak, uh, this photo was seen actually two days ago. Is three years, five months, is has been raised as a girl, current issues of speech delay, but other milestones have been achieved. Uh, thank you. Those, uh, yeah, thank you. Those are, those are very interesting cases. And I'll leave it up to you about what you want to do um, as far as, you know, sort of the, the global discussion of kids with DSD or intersex um, because the terminology has been changing here um, in the States a little bit. No one's quite happy with how we talk about kids with um, ambiguous genitalia. And that's, that's mostly political and social. But I think both cases have a lot of really interesting uh, aspects to them. Um, and if you want, I can sort of start a little bit talking about DSD. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a long discussion and I'll try to, I'll try to um, narrow it down. Uh, or we could talk about these cases in, uh, otherwise, or I can show you also uh, cases that I've come across when I have traveled through Africa uh, of similar cases and how we've managed those. Um, maybe, the, maybe the best thing to do is, maybe I'll start the talk a little bit and then, um, because I'll probably have to stop talking uh, probably a little after nine o'clock to get to my clinic. Um, I'll give a, I'll give sort of a brief summary of some things to consider about DSD cases, and then we can go right into these cases because both are very, very interesting. Um, 
Is, is that okay? We can proceed that way? Yes. Sir. Okay, great. I'm going to take over. Let me just see how I do this. Multiple advanced sharing options. Um, and this is where Ashley might have to help me. How do I take over? You'll just go down to share screen. Yeah. And just hit that. Yep. Oh, okay. Let me get into this talk. Um, iPhone, don't want that. Let's see here. Basic advanced files. Uh, I don't know if you can, can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, let me share it. Oh, okay, I gotta see the buttons. All right, there you go. All right. Now we've got it. Okay, cool. Let me, um, Go back to the beginning of this talk. Uh, let's see here. Just to give you an idea, this is a talk that I give the I give to the residents. Um, I give it to them. We have something here. We have grand rounds uh, weekly. It's usually two hours for our residents and fellows. And then in the summertime, we talk about. Um, we do summer school, it's called. So um, they're supposed to read the chapters in Campbell's or someplace or AUA guidelines and then go, go from there. Um, but this is, a, this is a, sort of the question that you get asked by most parents. Is this a male or a female uh, when you see a child like this? Now, this is a child with a normally formed phallus and I'll just tell you that uh, there are non-palpable gonads, and uh, this child was found to be 46XX. So rule number one, as you're probably all aware, beware of bilateral non-palpable testes because you may be dealing with a child with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, I've only seen one one patient in Africa after 30 some trips that had uh, CAH. And that's because the vast majority likely have the classic form of CAH and they end up with electrolyte abnormalities and usually uh, will, will have failure to thrive and, and die within the first maybe couple weeks of life. But so it's, it's more or less a medical emergency um, here in the States if you see that. Here's another question is a patient I saw a few years ago. As you can see, this child has a dialysis catheter placed uh, and no phallus. This is one of those rare cases of a, of a kid that has a failure. I've only seen this once um, and had dysplastic kidneys. And in fact, upon exploration did not have a, a bladder. Um, this child has since been transplanted and I created um, a pseudo phallus out of squirtle tissue, but normal testes 46XY. So the question for this patient is, does the phallus matter? And, and I'd have to say that after almost 30 years of doing this, the phallus doesn't matter that much. Um, it matters somewhat, but it does, it does matter. So uh, when I was a resident, um, the way we thought about kids with DSD, or intersex, as we call it in those days, was that the uh, phallus would determine what gender the child would be, regardless of the genetics. What's the reproductive potential of this child? This is a patient from Africa, perhaps similar to the last patient you presented, with a uh, hypospadias, cordy, and non-palpable gonads. So that comes up with rule number three, the potential for fertility and future fertility drives gender assignment. I would say that that's probably the overarching um, uh, bit of bit rule that sort of uh, guides us these days is what, what's the fertility potential? Um, the other is how do we avoid gender dysphoria? Will this patient have normal sexual function? This is a child with pretty much a blank perineum, uh, a small amount of either uh, a very small phallus, hypogonadism, or uh, 
potentially mild clitoromegaly with a blank perineum. Um, and the rule here is there is no such thing as normal sexual function. So, and I think we ascribe that to patients of where, despite our best efforts with regulating hormones, uh, giving them testosterone if they do not have testes, and in the case of gonadal dysgenesis, in cases of, uh, of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, we'll replace um, them with mineral corticoids uh, and sex steroids, uh, and also reconstructing their genitalia, um, we still may not achieve normal sexual function, particular male function. So that's to be kept in mind, especially for kids that, for instance, have um, some of the devastating types of anomalies such as bladder or colloidal extropy. What effect did androgens have on this child's brain in utero? That's kind of the million dollar question these days because uh, everyone is very concerned about avoiding a disaster of having a child um, that at some point in their life decides that they've been raised the wrong, the wrong gender or just unhappy with their genitalia. And those two things have kind of been clumped together, those two ideas. Um, it's, it's very difficult to tell, uh, but patients or children that have been virilized, um, such as this patient who's 46XX, uh, may have potentially a preponderance to, to um, assign themselves eventually as a male. This goes really against what we see in kids with very high testosterone levels in utero that are 46XX that are females. And, uh, and again, it comes, we look at kids with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, the, most of those uh, patients are um, raised as female and they identify as females and um, they also function normally as females and they're also heterosexual. So we don't know a lot about exactly, we can't determine yet what androgen's role will have on developing brains. Rule number five, testosterone, testosterone developing brain, nobody knows yet. So now what's the risk of the nano, uh, neoplasia in this child? And I think in both of your cases here, uh, there's some risk of, of gonadal cancer. And I think we need to talk about that a bit. This is a patient, again, from Africa. I've chosen some of these patients because we see many more cases of DSD in Africa than we do here in the States. Uh, but this is a classic ovotestis. And this is the boxcar type of ovotestis of where you have a testis on one side and you have an ovary on the other. This is the ovary, this is the testis. This testis looks very abnormal. Some of this is fimbria. Um, but, um, and I apologize, this is actually the ovotestis, sorry. Um, the one side is the ova, one side is the testis. And it, it, it kind of brings back for your second case that you biopsied the gonad and there's something that we have seen here is sampling error. So if you take one biopsy for one part of the gonad, for instance, in this case, and you take it from here, it may look like an ovary. If you take it from here, it may be more testicular. So it really begs the question of what's the role of biopsy of, of a gonad. I think it does play an important role, but in this case where it's clearly abnormal gonad, I, I think in these cases, we tend to remove these gonads anyway because of some uh, of a small risk of neoplasia. Um, and in this patient, uh, carried up was 46XX. Um, so I, I came up with the rule of a test. These are more trouble than they're worth. Um, many times these are, do not produce much in the way of, of either estrogen or testosterone. Um, and so the question is, well, why do we keep them? Especially if there's some risk of neoplasia. I will say I do follow two kids here in the States that were raised, uh, male with, uh, over testicular DSD. Um, both were raised as uh, male. Both have, both had their uh, either ovary removed uh, or uh, abnormal gonad on one side removed, and they're both have ovotestes, and they're both in the scrotum. 
and I've, I've managed these kids by ultrasound on an annual basis. Um, why not take them out and just replace them with testosterone? Well, uh, these kids are both teenagers. They don't want injections. Um, the parents recognize the small risk of cancer in, in these situations. Um, both kids are 46 XX. Um, and so um, again, the rule that many, many of you probably know that if there's a Y chromosome involved, there's a higher risk of neoplasia in these gonads um, is true, but we, we have to look at each case individually to try to determine what the overall risk is and how high the risk is. It depends on the diagnosis. This is another patient, looks similar to the patients you presented. Um, these are brothers. Uh, very similar in their appearance uh, of, of their genitalia, the cordy, hypospadiac meatus. There is not evidence of a second opening or a vaginal opening. Both have a palpable gonad. Um, and so what to remember is that only 50% uh, of kids that you, if you get a karyotype and they're 46XY, will actually have a genetic diagnosis. So despite the fact that we can do whole exome sequencing, that we can do microarrays, microarrays look at um, duplications or deletions uh, in just structurally along the, along, uh, the chromosomes um, that we can get easily here, um, we only make a diagnosis uh, in about 50% of these, of, of the 46 XY DSDs in general. They've been ascribed sometimes to uh, having, um, you know, a partial androgen insensitivity. Um, I don't know what that is. You can have complete androgen insensitivity, and those are phenotypically female, and they have intra-abdominal testes typically. But this is different. The partial androgen insensitivities is, is kind of this um, broad spectrum of patients that we don't know how to assign yet. In some cases, they do have syndromes. So here in the States, the, the most common type of diagnosis, as I mentioned, is CAH. Number two is something called mixed gonadal dysgenesis. It's also called Turner's uh, dysgenesis. It's got a couple different names now, but these are kids that have a mosaic karyotype, usually 45X, 46XY. Um, yet again, to to muddy the waters when it comes to looking at karyotypes. For both of your, for, for your one patient, your first patient uh, who's 46XX, um, that's a peripheral blood karyotype. We have now become more aware that if you were to sample the karyotype from the local tissue, for instance, um, if you were to biopsy the gonad that had descended in the first child, or even um, tissue in the area um, and, look at, and, and look at the karyotype uh, specifically, even from the urine, if you can get cells from the urine, we can look at the karyotype and we'll find that um, in, in those cases, we may actually see uh, evidence of 46XY, um, which is confusing. So even though the peripheral blood looks at a, a large number of cells, uh, for the karyotype, locally you may have um, you may have a different karyotype in, in the tissues that uh, don't agree with each other. If you have an ovary on one side and ovotestis on the other, so I, I think the first thing, and I think Emmanuel, you did a great job presenting uh, both the, both of those patients. I wish I could get the, my residents to do as nice a job because you did exactly what um, what I was what I was taught is how do, you, how do you describe these kids? And it's one thing to describe it um, to your colleagues, they, might, they may give you some slack, but when you, when you talk to a family and you say, um, your child has a small penis, that immediately infers that it's a male, when it may not be. Um, and when you say there's, uh, you know, the scrotum is not normally fused, again, describes it to a, to a male. So the phallus should be described is the best way to talk about this. When you have a newborn, let's say, and you're seeing him in the, in the, in the newborn nursery for the first time, right? Um, 
here's a patient with pretty advanced penis girdle transposition, almost complete penis girdle transposition. There's a bifid, uh, there's a bifid labia scrotal folds. Um, and this phallus has severe core D and does have an opening, which is actually perineal, a single perineal opening. Um, so these are the questions when my residents call me or we're up in the NICU, we're up in the ICU and we're looking at these babies is what's the phallus like? You describe the one to have about a three centimeter phallus. Uh, is there labioscrotal fusion, single perineal opening? And then most importantly, probably are there palpable gonads? And I really take the time to try to sort this out because if you can palpate one gonad, um, either in the canal or down in the labioscrota, then you've really, narrowed this down to just a couple diagnoses. At least here you've ruled out, conge uh, you've ruled out com uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So what haven't you ruled? Well, it still could be an androgen insufficiency issue in this child. Um, it could be an obotesticular abnormality because the only things that descend are testes and ovotestes. Ovaries never descend. So uh, ovotestes tend to be cryptorchid, but you can palpate them. Um, but I've, I think I've seen enough kids now, in particular in Africa, that will have a nor normally descended uh, uh, a gonad into the, into the scrotum. And if you get an ultrasound, sometimes your physical exam may not, uh, may not be helpful, but an ultrasound is, and it, it will show you the characteristics of an ovotestis. And the characteristics are either there's two types of ovotestes. You have the boxcar type where one side's an ovary, one side's a testis. But then you also have the testicular tissue that's embedded internally in the middle of an ovary. That's a much rarer situation, um, but it's also a possibility. Again, these can be looked at by ultrasound, even in newborns. So here's the six steps to making a diagnosis in these, in, in these kids. Um, so again, physical exam, um, if there's no palpable gonads, this is probably, and again, we're talking about a child with ambiguous genitalia, this is probably congenital adrenal hyperplasia. If there's one palpable gonad, it's most likely mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Again, I think in Africa, I would have to put in over testicular DSD as, as a, a very strong possibility. And then, uh, and, and, and by the way, the, the, what is the hallmark of mixed gonadal dysgenesis is a streak gonad on one side and a testicle on the other side. Um, and then if there's two palpable gonads with, let's say, a very small phallus and hypospadiac meatus, um, then we're looking at probably an undervirilized male. Um, and these, and as I mentioned before, this is where with the undervirilized males, you're really looking for a genetic diagnosis. You're looking for um, a deletion of DAX1 or FGF13. Um, these are, these are um, tests that are now becoming a little bit easier to obtain here in the States um, on, a, on a commercial basis even. Um, and hopefully Africa won't be too far behind in having that. I think the next thing, other than your physical exam being very important, uh, is an ultrasound of the pelvis. Because an ultrasound of the pelvis is gonna show you this structure behind the bladder, right? It's gonna show you the uterus. And if you see the, the uterus on a sagittal view, well, you've already narrowed down the diagnosis uh, again. A karyotype is uh, also uh, uh, necessary. Um, and uh, after that, endocrine labs. Um, again, a 17 OHP level um, to, to rule, out, rule out or rule in congenital renal hyperplasia. Electrolytes, not absolutely necessary within the first few days of life, but certainly by day three or four, you may see abnormalities. And then you want testosterone, gonadotropin levels, FSH, LH, and if, it's, if possible, inhibin B, and Mullerian inhibiting hormone. These are now standard tests we can get here. Um, inhibin B is made by Sertoli cells as is, 
uh, MIH. Um, the other name for uh, MIH is anti-mullerian hormone. So there's a couple different names for this hormone, but both are made by Sertoli cells. And we only see that in, in males. So they'd have to have testes. Um, then genetic te testing. Uh, fish is used that usually is looking in particular, it's a quick way of looking for uh, SRY, uh, which is on uh, the, the short arm of the Y chromosome. Um, it can translocate, and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later, and that's where you do get ambiguous genitalia in, in patients that are 46XX, and with the translocation of SRY, will be essentially under virilized males. So that's an important test to see if you can obtain. A microarray, um, again, looks for copy number variants. That's where you may have large deletions or duplications uh, in chromosomes. Duplications do the same as deletions uh, in many cases. Duplications of an area in a chromosome that, especially in X or Y, will um, actually negate the properties of that gene. Um, and then whole exome sequencing. This has really kind of undergone uh, a, a significant um, availability here in the States where, you know, 10 years ago, it, it was all done on a research basis alone. It was quite expensive. It was very hard to get. And now you can, you can obtain whole exome sequencing by sending off to a couple of different commercial places. And even I think our university does this. Um, and so we tend to get this on, on, many, on many of our patients. And then it sometimes comes down to laparoscopy and a gonadal biopsy. And you have to do that uh, sometimes to make an absolute diagnosis. This is a laparoscopy. And this um, looks uh, to me as an ovotestis. Uh, it's not a testis, uh, it's certainly not an ovary. Um, oftentimes the testes will not have a tunica albuginea in these cases, um, and uh, we call that a dysgenetic testis portion. It also certainly goes along with the diagnosis of any uh, child that has ovotesticular DSD. Um, so in this case, you really have to sample from both sides. And this is prior to, you know, as I mentioned before, we tend to remove of a testes. Um, but uh, in this case, this is not going to descend. It's the, in, the internal ring is closed. I see more Mullerian, or yeah, Mullerian structures here more than I see any evidence of a vas deferin, but there usually is a rudimentary vas deferin to these. Um, so laparoscopy sometimes becomes important. Let's click over here. So diagnosis step one, uh, we talked about the physical exam. Actually, I didn't know I did this. I forgot I had, I had set it up this way. Uh, I think, Emmanuel, you, went, you did a nice job in presenting the history, um, talking about even exposure history or, or, or maternal issues. Uh, Co-sanguinity is, is common in certain areas in Africa. Um, uh, exposure to endocrine disruptors, um, mostly chemical, being around chemical plants, things like that. Um, and was there any maternal virilization? And was there any other early deaths of children in their family? Um, you know, some of this is kind of gets to the history of why we have, you know, why we've struggled with trying to diagnose kids with intersex disorders is because there's many different names. This all comes from about uh, 2005 where a consensus statement was made looking at the confusion of how patients were referred to. We do not use the term pseudohermaphrodite anymore or hermaphrodite or even sex reversal. Um, and, and really because of the advances of molecular uh, genetics, we're, we're honing in on trying to be more exact. DSD is defined as a congenital condition uh, in which the development of chromosomal, gonadal, or internal external anatomic sex is atypical. So some people will say, well, if you have a, a boy with, with a mild hypospadias, is that considered a DSD or an intersex disorder? And I would say, no, it's not. Nor would I say that a, a patient that 
has high um, uh, uh, hydroxyprogesterone levels, 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels in utero is a DSD. Um, because that is really a, that's, that's a hormonal abnormality. And in most cases, we don't know why, why boys have hypospadias. But I don't think they should be defined as a DSD in terms of policies that are being dictated these days uh, in Europe and uh, in, in the United States. But there are certainly some, unfortunately, there's some places here in the United States, San Francisco in particular, that have tried to ban hypospadias repair. They've tried to ban circumcision on a political standpoint, saying that you're interfering with the genitalia of a child who can't make a decision for themselves of what gender they may or may not want to be. It's a crazy argument. Um, that's why I'd rather practice medicine in Africa than here some days. So the problem with DSD, and I, I knew this as a resident, that I was continually confused. But I think, as I mentioned in the, in the history and physical, um, that you can do this in a systematic way. No one's going to blame you if you at least get the facts together and you say, this is what I have. Then you can go home and try to figure out exactly what the patient has. And you're under no obligation to say to the family or to the pediatrician, this is the diagnosis. I just made this diagnosis this minute. This sometimes takes some deep thought and even talking to your colleagues about, you know, what, what do we do in these cases? What should we, what, how should we move forward and what gender do we help the parents decide? In the old days, these decisions were made by uh, the physician. A physician would say, you have a girl, you have a boy. And that was the end of it. Nowadays, it's, a, it's very much a shared decision, especially in the complicated cases such as obotesticular DSD or um, the Turner's type uh, patients uh, that have 45X, 46XY, the mixed spinalis genesis, where really the gender May, may be determined solely on what the parents want um, after they're informed. Um, so I'll go through this quickly and then we should maybe talk about the cases a little bit, but the old terminology, and now we're heading back toward intersex again, female pseudohermaphrodites are 46XX DSD, male pseudohermaphrodites have become 46, XY DSD. Um, a true hermaphrodite is now obotesticular DSD. Uh, the XX male sex reversal, which in most cases, uh, these kids are um, have a translocation of the SRY to an X chromosome. And um, they usually have testes that make testosterone not great necessarily, uh, but they're usually infertile. They're, as a matter of fact, they're always infertile. Um, they have dysgenetic testes. Uh, XY sex reversals are the Frazier syndrome. You may have heard of Frazier syndrome. And this is the 46XY complete gonadal dysgenesis. These are the patients that are female that typically present in their teens. They're not menstruating and they get a workup, they're found by ultrasound not to have a uterus. Uh, and they, in fact, don't have gonads on laparoscopy. They tend to have straight gonads bilaterally. Um, and this is really just a, it's a failure of gonadal development early in, early, early, early in gestation um, in fetal development. This was, if you saw this paper, this was the chart that, you know, as residents, we had you know, residents had to learn back in the mid 2000s. And I don't think this chart is necessarily very helpful. Um, you can find this in the Hughes paper. It's actually been published a number of other places in textbooks. Um, but what I, what I sort of found, um, oh, somebody wants to join us, sorry about that. Um, what I found that um, in this case, what this really represents um, is big chromosomal defects um, versus, uh, versus, um, one second, oops, 
uh, single gene defects. So when, when you have, for instance, the easiest one to discuss is probably um, is probably uh, disorders of androgen synthesis or action. So it, these are the kids that are 46XY that present, they're phenotypically female. Um, they have what appears to be a normal clitoris. They have a normal perineal exam. If you were to examine the vagina, they would have a short uh, uh, blind ending vagina, an ultrasound, they have no uterus. They sometimes present with an, with an inguinal hernia and you're surprised to find a testis. And these are the kids with complete androgen insensitivity. So again, we're relying on what we know about karyotype. For the 46XX DSD, um, the most common is disorders of androgen excess that you see with the, the conversion of, of uh, uh, into 17 hydroxyprogesterone from with a 21 hydroxylase deficiency in these cases. So um, again, this is some terminology just as part of policy, sexual determination. It's the initial event that determines whether the gonads will develop as testes or ovaries. I think these become kind of interchangeable and confusing, but um, this is the actual di or definition of sexual determin determination. And this is based solely on chromosomal and genetic determinants. Depends on what's gonna happen with the gonad. Is it gonna go in from a bipotential gonad into a testis or an ovary? And then there's sexual differentiation. That's everything that happens after that. That's the physiologic anatomic process of either not having enough androgen or having too much androgen. That's directed by hormones secreted by those gonads. Um, and it, it's also affected by the receptors that are on these sites, the receptors that are on the genitalia. Um, you can have a complete androgen insensitivity as a receptor abnormality um, at, the, at, the, uh, at the end tissue. Um, the question is, is the differentiation of the brain. So again, and I, I think a good case study are those kids with complete androgen insensitivity. Um, very, very few of these kids um, uh, actually, they're raised female, uh, they're phenotypically female, they have very high testosterone levels, they're 46 XY. Um, however, uh, very few of these uh, patients are homosexual and almost none uh, have gender dysphoria. So it's, again, it it's conflicts with the whole idea of uh, exactly uh, how the brain uh, is affected by some of these abnormalities. Um, determination as a cause of a DSD is about one in 20,000. Um, again, when you have a genetic abnormality, such as Treacher Collins, as you mentioned, uh, or Fraser syndrome, and then differentiation uh, as a DSD event, meaning that this is where you can have normal gonads, um, but you may have an undescended testis, a small phallus, or clitoromegaly due to increased uh, 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 testosterone conversion. Um, that you may have sexual ambiguity. We do see kids here that have severe hypospadias that are you know, normal males, other than the fact their genitalia just didn't develop quite well. Uh, again, some people will consider this a sexual ambiguity. Okay, so what's the, what's, what does SRY do? And the sole reason that SRY exists is to activate SOX9. So this brings up the point of well, what happens if you have a SOX9 deletion uh, or duplication, or you have other, you other, you have other upstream abnormalities that affects SOX9. So keep that in mind. Um, and uh, when we talk about gonadal differentiation, and I, this is important, that because SRI activates SOX9, well how, well, how does it do that? And this is a, yet again an evolving process. But in an XY gonad, SRI affects SOX9 which is a feedback loop and ends up with testicular development. Other important genes that are also important that affect SOX9 
our FGF9, PGDS. So if these are abnormal, um, it can also affect SOX9 development, testicular development. When you look at an X, X gonad, we used to think that uh, an ovary uh, developed solely out of the fact of inhibition of uh, SOX9 not working out. Now we know that there's many other genes that affect uh, how the ovary is, uh, is created. Went for uh, beta uh, catetin uh, affects SOX9 ovarian development. And FOXL2 is also quite important, working as a feedback loop to inhibit SOX9. So it's also the inhibition of genes on SOX9 that end up with ovarian development. Um, I think just for time's sake, let's talk about, let's talk about these cases. And let me see if there, oops, that's MIH. I do have maybe something here that does, yeah, I'm trying, I do have a, a flow chart, but I think what I'd like to do is talk about these cases now. Um, and maybe if we have time, we can talk about um, some of these other things that might be helpful. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second here. Um, and Emmanuel, do you wanna, do you wanna, we can just have an open discussion at this point. If you wanted to share your screen again about the first case, or we can just talk about it, it's up to you. Uh, I think you can just talk about it. Huh? Yeah, sure. Mm. So I think the first thing that, uh, from my standpoint with this, with this patient is I'm glad to hear that the patient was raised um, a male. Um, I, I, the, the problem is I don't know. Oh, it looks like we have other, uh, we have other pictures here. Okay. Um, okay, great. So I don't know if there's a right answer for this patient, but by the age of three, um, I can only imagine how disruptive it would be to, you know, to suggest that the patient should be raised female based on karyotype alone. Um, and I guess the other question is some of those other parameters that I mentioned as far as future fertility, maybe driving, uh, you know, what gender you should assign may not be, ap you know, applicable under the same circumstances, because for instance, if you did have a testis in this child and if it was dysgenetic and there are very few germ cells, then what are the chances this patient's going to be fertile? Or if reconstructing this patient becomes multiple operations that leaves the patient unable to uh, have intercourse um, and and makes makes it difficult uh, for them to uh, to have a normal sex life, let's say. So it it becomes a, a problem to maybe use some of the same those same parameters uh, to determine exactly what the best thing to do is. But I I would think in situations of where a, a child is already three years of age um, to to change gender would be disruptive, not only to the, the patient, but also to the family and also to the community, community that they live in. Um, I had a patient in, um, in Kenya who came to see us, who was 17, raised a male, uh, and she clearly identified as a female. Uh, she had clitoromegaly, she had an ovotesticular DSD, but saw herself as a female. And she had to move in with an aunt who lived in a different city about 100, well, probably 200 kilometers away. Um, and she had already taken those steps because she wanted to have uh, surgery to create a clitoris and a vagina. So that's just one example. But, um, this, but those are maybe some of the things that could happen. So in this case, you have a dis on the left side, you have an intra-abdominal gonad and the biopsy came back as 
showing it as an ovary, is that correct? Yeah, yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. And then, and then uh, 46XX, and the right side, we don't know what it is other than it feels like a testicle. Yes. And there are probably some Mullerian structures. But we know that because you've found a uterus. Yep. So, yes. So most likely, you're right. This is an ovotesticular DSD. Um, it's almost maybe certain that that's the case. And, and one question as well, what do you do with the, um, there was no ultrasound done prior to doing the laparoscopy. Maybe there was, let's see. Uh, yeah. It, it was normal. Basically, they, they didn't see any structures. Huh? Yeah. Okay, they didn't see no, the uterus. Was, um, yeah. Um, yeah, actually, we, we didn't expect it to um, have them. It was done to see if the, the contralateral testes can be seen, uh, but it wasn't seen and no, uh, no, uh, no, uh, a Mirarian structures was also reported. Uh, so that's why we uh, went on to do a laparoscopy. Yeah, Mainly, I did. Yeah. 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 No, you did exactly, you did exactly the right thing. Um, I think I, you know, to have to try to determine what was going on internally, because you already had the suspicion with the phallus being uh, enlarged. Uh, with only one palpable gonad and with the severe, you know, with the meatus being in, in the wrong position that you already had that suspicion this was an intersex or DSD situation. Uh, I would say the most common, even just on initial inspection without having an ultrasound and seeing a patient like this, now that I've seen so many kids, I always think it's a testicular DSD until proven otherwise. Um, so the question is at this point, being raised a male, the family wants to raise this patient as a male. Um, that um, uh, you know, what what do you do? And I, I think you're looking at a couple of things. One is I'd probably uh, recommend you know maybe getting an ultrasound of the right gonad of that of that right what's believed to be a right testis just to see what it looks like. And this way you'll know whether or not that you know this could be an ova testis or not. Um, it's very rare to actually see a testis on one side and an ovary on the other. That's, that's, that's very, very rare. Um, yeah. so I think more likely it's going to be an over testis on the right side. Um, and potentially just from biopsying that gonad and did you actually make biopsy it laparoscopically or did you biopsy it by just making an inguinal incision and popping it out? Uh, laparoscopically, it was done laparoscopically. In, um... Okay, oh. and that all came back as ovary, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's two options there. I think, I think you know, um, that ovary is not at risk for neoplasia, I would say it's a, it's a low risk, but um, the question is going to be, once puberty starts, um, this patient may start to develop breasts, um, you know, the secondary female characteristics. So um, in that case, probably before puberty, removing that ovary would be a good idea. Um, so, and I, I think that can be done at, you know, this patient's only three years old. As far as the right gonad goes, I would just, I'd be... I'd be cautious with it. Probably, you know, an annual exam is important as this patient gets gets older. And I wouldn't be surprised if the right testis would or the right gonad was nova testis. Um, and even you may get back, you know, if you were to remove the left gonad, you may you may find that there's testicular stroma there too. So I wouldn't be surprised to find that. Thank you. Actually, actually, uh, right, uh, I mean the ultrasound of the right gonad was done and was uh, uh, recorded as testis, but uh, ultrasound is uh, user-dependent and I uh, don't know if we should really uh, uh, 
uh, uh, trust that because uh, one of the the question was should we on and biopsy that side uh, and the the androgen the testosterone is is very low right if i remember well maybe emmanuel you can bring back the the, the results the hormone results but if it's uh, it's very low uh and then that that issue that you also raised uh of if we yeah we keep him as the, as a male as they wish uh at puberty he might develop uh breasts which is very disrupting too. I've seen one patient who was like that and uh, after developing breast, that was the most uh, uh, disrupting thing for uh, for him, you no? Know? He came say, uh, saying, please get, get rid of these breasts, others will, <laughs> with other things will come later. Um, so sh should we, should be biopsy the right gonad? Is there an uh, added value for that? Yeah, um, I I would probably, I probably would get an, I'd probably wait uh, at this point because right now the pituitary um, from a gonadotropin standpoint is in hibernation and therefore the gonads are in hibernation until puberty. So I think I, yeah. I might with this kid, if, if unless you're concerned about losing him to follow up for some reason, I would probably just monitor this kid through childhood and repeat an ultrasound at some point. I don't think it needs to be done now, but I might wait till the child's five or seven and repeat it. Um, and physical exam may, may tell you as well. So I think you have time it, my, not that I have a big downside to doing biopsy. Again, it comes down to sampling error for one thing. Typically, most of these most of these gonads are going to be box cars. So you be able to tell the difference. Um, but the other issue is just biopsying a gonad in general it requires general anesthesia. You know, sometimes you can remove some tissue that you didn't want to remove. But I, you know, but I, I do think in this case, we'll probably make that, you know, to make that diagnosis for years sake and also for the families so they can say, you know, we have a normal testis on this side or we have an ab abnormality. If it turns out to be an ovotestis, then it does beg the question about uh, future, uh, future risk of malignancy. Um, we, and I, and I think in that case, despite 46, uh, well, this patient, this is the second patient. This patient's 46XY. Um, is XX. Oh, XX. XX. We're still, I'm sorry, we're talking about the first patient. Sorry. Yeah, okay. with, with the right one, you know, I, I would think genetically, if you had a way of testing that genetically, the testicular tissue, you might find that that tissue in the testis is actually has a Y chromosome. Now, we used to think that the ovotestes had a high risk for malignancy. I think overall, it's probably relatively low. And, and the reason for that, I think, is because the tissue that becomes um, malignant are the germ cells. And because there's usually not many germ cells in these gonads, that the risk is, is, is actually pretty low. So I, I dial, in, in a sense, I dial down my 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 concern for malignancy in these kids. Um, and instead, I'd be more concerned that if this were an ovotestis, then, then what do you do in that case? Do you try to remove the ovary part of the gonad and leave the testicular part? People talk about that. Um, how, how viable do you leave the, uh, the, the remaining testis portion of, a, of, a, of an ovotestis? Those are, those are a bit of a challenge. And how do you remove all the ovarian tissue as well? That's hard to do because usually there's some intermingling at the interface between these gonads. So you gotta be careful um, of what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, I'm not worried so much about um, the 
if this is, is in fact a, a, an ovary on the left side about the malignancy aspect, I, like we talked about, I think I'd be more concerned about just feminization uh, during puberty. So if the child is going to need a bio, is going to need a procedure in the future anyway, you can certainly at the same time remove the left ovary and then, uh, you know, uh, take a look at the right one if there's concern. Many times ult ultrasound, uh, you know, our radiologists here make the presumption that if it's in the scrotum, it's a testicle. But when you look carefully at the images, you may say like, oh, okay, well, that, that's not a, that's not a, that's not all testicle. There's something else going on here. So anyway, this patient's in a quiescent phase in hibernation until you know puberty starts. The second case, um, I I don't know much about Treacher Collins. Usually, you know, I, I know they have usually some um, developmental delay. They usually have a, an ear abnormality. Um, and they can have genital abnormalities too. But this is the, the kiddo who's a one-year-old who's 46XY, who has a severe, uh, who has a, a perineal opening. Uh, the pelvic ultrasound was, the, the pel pelvic ultrasound was done and it didn't show a uterus, is that correct? No, it did show a uterus. Oh, it did show a uterus. And this yes, is 46XY. Yes. No. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, okay. I missed that part, sorry. Um, so impression feature says the female patient. Uh, there's a uterus and an axle to this location. So um, this is an unusual, kind of an unusual case with the uterus with, with virilization. Um, they don't see any gonads by ultrasound. I'm not surprised by that. Ultrasound is very poor at looking at intra-abdominal gonads. Um, in children. So 50% of the time, if there were, for instance, a testicle intra-abdominal, it's going to miss it. Um, and 50% of the time, they're going to say it's there and it's not. So I usually don't think, I don't get too concerned about, um, about trying to determine if a gonad is intra-abdominal or not. So this patient could, um, you know, the question is here, what kind of what's going on? This is a little bit of an unusual situation because you have a, a uterus, you have 46XY. Um, if there were normal testes, then with Mullerian inhibiting substance, uh, you, you wouldn't have had a uterus. So it really begs the question, what kind of gonads does this patient have? On the other hand, why is there any pleuromegaly in this kid? Um, which, which means that there must have been testosterone at some point during development. Um, I, again, I doubt it was maternal uh, uh, increased testosterone that would have, would have caused this. Um, so um, I, I think it does beg the question of what do the gonads look like? I think this patient's kind of a good candidate for laparoscopy to determine what the gonads are. Um, coming up with a diagnosis is, is a bit of a challenge here. Could this be a patient who somewhere in utero lost their, lost both gonads? Um, and, which, and that's called vanishing testis syndrome. That can happen, that can, that can happen mid gestation or it can happen just before birth. Typically those kids are pretty normally virilized, but when you explore them, you find blind ending uh, spermatic arteries and, and vessels. Um, that's a possibility. Um, the problem is that the uterus isn't explained in that case. Um, so again, there's, um, there's something unusual about this case that there would be a uterus with a 46XY um, the only, and I, and I don't think this is a gonadal dysgenesis, you know, like a pure gonadal dysgenesis, um, in the sense that if it were, there wouldn't be any, uh, you know, you would have straight gonads, you'd have female phenot, you'd be female phenotypically with 46XY, that's like Fraser syndrome. 
Um, the other thing that's odd here are all the is the dysmorphism of the of this of the face. Um, this this doesn't stand out to me immediately as what what the diagnosis is for this for this patient. Um, I, I will check with one of my colleagues, uh, one of our endocrinologists, who's also a geneticist, and and run this by her, and I can get back to you. Um, but this is an this doesn't immediately bring up. Uh, a diagnosis in my mind where you can have this compilation of pelvic structures, uh, no gonads. And, and I think the, um, I, I don't think hormonal testing is going to be helpful at this point, though. Um, the other reason to do is to know about these gonads is just from a, is just from a, again, a malignancy standpoint. Um, you know, the thing that we worry about in kids that have gonadal dysgenesis is that we do recommend we remove the, those gonads because there is a risk of, of gonadoblastoma in those kids or dysgerminoma, gonadoblastoma turning into dysgerminoma. So we do worry about that in, in those kids a little bit. Um, and was there... The other thing that we do sometimes, I, I, I know you don't have an inhibin level in this kid or an MI uh, or a AMH or MIS level, do you? No, 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 we don't have. No, I don't have those, yeah. I mean, this would be a great case if we could get a blood sample uh, sent to us so we can take the DNA and do whole exome sequencing. I would love to do that. Um, and the way that we've the way that we've done this in the past is is bring blood samples back with us, and then we just test it here on a research basis um, to make to make diagnoses. No, I think we, we can discuss that and see the legal and uh, ethical. But... The legal and ethical from what a, a blood sample. No, no, from, from, I, I, I don't know the, I've never done that here, so I don't know how to, I'll discuss with the. It's, it's probably, some, some countries have bans, as an example, um, you're not allowed to remove blood samples and, and then take them out with you from Kenya, as an example. Um, whereas in Zambia, um, it's, it's, as long as you have, something from the Minister of Health that says that this is for research basis, you can do that. Um, they do prefer it being sent by uh, DHL as opposed to carrying it on a commercial airline though. So there are no, I don't think there's hard and fast rules except for those countries that outright ban blood products being removed from the, or tissue being removed from the country. As a, as a matter of fact, Kenya strictly prohibits even sending tissue samples to uh, Nairobi, I'm sorry, not to Nairobi, but to uh, Dakar, for instance, other, other places where we can have free pathology done. Um, typically, those samples aren't allowed to be sent. I mean, they may get sent, but it's it's probably illegal in that sense. So you might have to just check with your country to see what's what's allowed. Uh, unfortunately, many times you find out there isn't maybe a strict rule, but then um, at spur of the moment, they'll decide that you're not allowed to do that uh, without there being a formal law. Um, so yeah, we may be, may be stuck. Now there certainly are research protocols and, and things here at the University of Pittsburgh where people have been doing genetic testing on populations and they are able to transport that blood back. But again, it's, again it has to come from the Minister of Health. It has to have uh, what's called an IRB. Um, do you have a formal IRB process in your yeah yeah you do yeah yeah we have it oh that's great because you're one of the then you're one of the few countries that that in Africa that does have an IRB and so if we if our IRB connected with your IRB and we had IRB protocols that were acceptable then we could probably easily uh, be able to transport tissue for pathologic examination but more importantly for genetic testing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be. Yeah, we, we can explore. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was going to say we, we can explore that. I know 
uh, it's possible because I know uh, another research where they are doing that, but I, I don't know what it required. So we, we can explore more on that. Uh, or, or maybe we it can be an opportunity for us to, to develop, uh, like to do a, a research here on our patient. And uh, uh, in that we, uh, we, we put that and we get a near IB approval for that. For those who need it, we can send the samples for, uh, for uh, pathological analysis and genetic And you know what, Emmanuel, why don't you do this? Why don't yes, I'll have to, or that wasn't Emmanuel. Who was speaking just then? That was uh, Innocent, Dr. Innocent. Innocent. Okay, yeah, well, to, yeah, to Emmanuel and Innocent, you know, if you send us, uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll send you our IRB consent forms, okay? And you can use that as a template for your IRB, all right? And I'm meeting uh, tomorrow okay. with our uh, cytogeneticist who does all of our microarrays and uh, ho and ho who does all the sequencing. Um, and she has a grant to do that. Um, so I'll talk with her tomorrow about being able to do this. We've, we ran into problems probably about 10 years ago, 15 years ago with our IRB because you know they, they weren't super comfortable with countries like Ghana that we were getting letters from the Minister of Health where there was not a formal IRB process. And it, you know, it's, it's very difficult. You have to find the right people to talk to and get everybody in agreement in the same room. That's really hard to do. Um, but I think I'll talk to her tomorrow and I'll, I can get back to you then next week um, about how to move forward. And she actually is the one who has the IRB protocol. I'm, a, I'm one of the PIs on the, on the study. Um, it's mostly for patients here in the States, but I think we have, we have an international IRB. We have an international IRB as well, um, which I'm the PI on, and I can send you those consent forms. Um, and so you can use all, not just the consent forms, but I can send you that as a template. Okay. okay. And then I think you can, you can just cut and paste and use what you want and, and modify it. And it might work out pretty good, but I'll, um, I'll check, I'll check with our slide of genetics. So I'm meeting with her tomorrow. So I'll, I'll, we'll have a nice discussion about it. Um, but I will say something doesn't totally make sense with this last patient for me. And I'm either I'm half asleep or, uh, yeah. So karyotypes 46 XY, no poppable gonads, uh, and has a uterus. And then the dysmorphic features don't quite make sense to me um, of how that plays into it. But I, I think just looking from a urologic standpoint, from a reproductive standpoint, um, yeah, something's, something's not, doesn't quite make sense here. Okay, thank you. And now, unfortunately, I have to sign off because I've got, I've got to run down to my clinic. Oh. Okay, thank you, Prof. I think this was, was very, very helpful, uh, especially for the, this, the, the first case. Uh, uh, the way forward, uh, I think we will we'll see if we can do the, um, remove the, the ovaries and the mental interest, and uh, yeah, we, we follow up the, the right gonad. Right, and and then you will definitely need the hypospadias repair if uh, it's to be a med. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if you want, why don't we? What we can do is, innocent. If you want to, uh, just email me, then about the conclusions we made about recommendations for these patients, uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure we're on the same page, and sure. then we can just have a we can go you know, kind of back and forth to make sure we, as you make progress and, and find more information, we can talk about it real time. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. You all have a great day. It's beautiful here Thank in the you, state. Dr. Schneck. It's my pleasure, Ashley. All right. You guys all take care. Thank you for coming.